Two friends, two pastors, two theologians, exploring God and the greatest mysteries of life. Unscripted. I'm Dr. Wes Arblaster. And I'm Dr. Ethan Smith. And we are Mysterio. Today on the season two <laughs> finale of Mysterion, we answer questions. We're in a new place because we've been kicked out of our old location. We are going to call this questions from the closet. No? <laughs> it feels like... <laughs> it feels like we're in a closet, right? Yeah, no, we're not calling it, it that. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I mean, well, you know. Hey, this is where the new set will be. <laughs> and when we come back in a matter of a few weeks to a month or so, it'll look totally different. Yeah, yeah. So for three, season three, we got we to gotta come up with a new backdrop for our new set, our new yes. studio yeah. or whatever. Hey, you guys share your idea. Tell us what you think we should do with all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And before we get into this episode, we also want to make an announcement to those of you who are in the area. And those of you who don't know, the area is the Dayton Springfield area. On November 5th this year at 7 o'clock at Restoration Park Church, if you want to come to gather and ask questions. We're going to have a gathering of those who listen to the podcast or anybody who's interested to ask questions. And then also we want to talk to you. We want to know what you yep. want to hear, what's working for you, what's not, what you'd like to see us do, mm -hmm. and have a, a, a general conversation. So there'll be a question time. Bring any of the questions that you have. Maybe you didn't want to put them online. Maybe you're not online. That's fine. Bring those, and we'll have this open conversation. And then you can be a part of planning season three as well. So November 5th at Restoration Park Church in Building A, right? Yes. Remember, remember the 5th of November. I, I, I have to say that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And maybe we'll bring some biscuits or coffee or something and have a little... Biscuits? <laughs> that's, that's British for cookie, man. Remember the 5th of November. Yeah. All right. Well, whatever. Yeah, so come, come. That'll be fun. We'll have a good time. Get to know the Mysterion folks around here, and you guys yeah. can help us out. Figure out where we're going um, for season three. Season three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're in transition now. But what we did, we asked you guys last week on Facebook, we said... Any questions you got, that's how we decide we're going to uh, wrap up this season. Mm -hmm. And we got l actually a lot of really, really good, great response. Really good questions. Uh, not just a lot of questions, really good questions. And yep. we cannot address them all. No way. There's no chance we can do that in one episode. However, a lot of the things you asked, I think, will show up in season three. Yep. And also, you know, what happened was we were sitting there kind of going through the questions. And it really sparked just trying to think through the questions and how would we answer these questions. Mm -hmm. It really sparked a really good conversation between Ethan and myself, something mm -hmm. we said, you know what, what we should do is instead of breaking our episode up into three or four different things and just try and address those, really get a little bit deeper into one of the central issues that really came out of us trying to process mm -hmm. the questions you guys asked, which we think is something mm -hmm. really, really important. Yeah, so you know, one of the things I, I would say is the hallmark of Mysterion is actually a way of reading scripture. This is what we're getting to. Yep. Uh, it, the, in the way that, that the fathers and the mothers of the church teach us to engage scripture, that is different than how a lot of us were raised in the church. And then some of us who watch this have had a certain kind of education at, at seminary or at the university or so forth. And it's a little different there. And what we imagine theological questions to be are therefore different. Mm -hmm. We are not trying to do a thing that's combining theology and spiritual life as two things that just don't typically get brought together. We actually think theology and spiritual life belong together inherently, and we think the fathers show us a way into the scripture where those things actually cannot be pulled apart. Yes. And some of the questions, some of the issues, the big theological issues look very differently when you approach it in this way. So mm -hmm. we want to get at um, uh, a few of your questions by actually taking straightforwardly this, this issue, this difference of how we read scripture. Yeah, so let's just touch on a couple of these questions really quick. So Aaron mm -hmm. Beethoven asked a question about, what's your take on the fall? How did it happen? What sense can we make of it, et cetera, in light of, he said specifically, God's creating everything out of nothing. Now, um, the real question is, is how, how do we read the fall? Like, right. how do we understand the fall? And Mysterion um, is very c consciously attempting to read scripture in conversation with the fathers. And mm -hmm. so our immediate question is, how do the fathers read the, read the fall? Mm -hmm. Well, 
that's going to be the issue that we're going to begin to try to attend to today. Yeah, questions about Genesis 3, the sin of Adam and Eve and the being cursed. Is that history? Is it not? Right, because— Is it literal? Yeah. Is it symbolic? All these kinds of questions. When did it happen? Right. How does it affect us today? These types of things, I think, are, are what Aaron's getting at, which is a burning question among some today. Yeah, I mean, typically today, when you bring up Genesis or the first chapters of Genesis— the immediate questions are things like this. Um, is Genesis 1 through 3, um, is it literal, that is, historical, mm-hmm. or is it poetic and figural? That's mm-hmm. one of the first questions that people ask. Do we read it literally and historically or poetically and figurally? And what we're going to find is the fathers do neither. Actually, they do something else, which includes some of both. Yeah, and when you, when you say, or, or figuratively or poetically, I mean, just, just a bunch of metaphors that express yes. something about life, yes. and that's it, yes. right? It's, it's literally false, but just a bunch of metaphors that are useful. Yes. And we'll find both the, the, is it primarily history, the way a historian would tell it, or is it just a bunch of myths and metaphors? Neither of those are really getting at not only the fathers, but the way the New Testament itself reads these passages, as we'll see. Exactly. Now, uh, um, we, uh, Jedediah asked a question about the cross, too. What was going on with the cross? And what, he, what is happening on the cross, right? So he's not just a theory of an atonement question he asked, but, but what is God doing at Calvary? And so one of the things, again, this seemed to touch on the similar, similar kind of issue. First, we have the fall, and here we have the cross. How do we read these events? How do we understand these events? Um, typically, when we say, when we ask ourselves, for example, what's going on on the cross, we say, well, what happened back then? What was mm-hmm. happening 2,000 years? ago on the cross. And again, what we're going to find is that the fathers tend not to look at the cross through that specific mm-hmm. lens so much. When they approach the questions about the cross, and the truth about the cross, as they read scripture, as they attempt to understand scripture, it has a, they have a yeah. different relationship entirely. So obviously with the cross, we are talking about a historical event. Jesus, I mean, you know, there's a debate with Adam, but with Jesus, clearly this historical a figure who died on the cross, whose tomb was empty. These are historical events. But the question becomes, how does that relate to us here? With Adam, the issue is, is there is what separates us from the reality of Adam and Adam's fall a uh, history, or do we need a theory? With the cross, so often what we have is, well, this guy died. How does that change my life? Yeah. And we presume this sort of distance, and what tends to get filled in there is some kind of abstract theology about how it worked. What change did it make? And what we'll see here is in the New Testament itself and in the Church Fathers, the idea that there's some distance to be bridged, either by a a telling of history or by a theory of how things work, they just didn't have that sense of a distance, which we'll get into in a second. Mm -hmm. So they didn't need historical Jesus studies. Uh, They didn't need theories of the atonement and how it works because they saw it as having an immediate presence in their lives. Mm -hmm. So both of these two things, the fall and the cross, and some of the other questions address some of the other kinds of great, um, we might say, events. We might Mm -hmm. call them events. Um, How do we approach these events? How do we approach them um, as we read Scripture Mm -hmm. specifically? That's our fundamental question today. And what we're going to find, again, is the fathers tend to do it very differently from us. Mm -hmm. Um, um, And I think one of the things we want to get into is actually how that happened. Like, why Mm -hmm. is it that we tend to read um, the events of Scripture differently than the Fathers read? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so... Well, I think one way to get into it is is to take a passage from 1 Corinthians and Mm -hmm. talk about Paul words a, a sentence a specific way, and what we'll notice is we tend to think that he should have said it a different way. And we can get into that history of why we seem to think it should be a different way. Yes. Now, so our two questions today are about Adam and the fall and how that relates to us, and also Christ, specifically his cross, his death, and how that relates to us. So uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, uh, in this one passage, Paul mentions both Adam and Christ. And he says this, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Mm -hmm. And we want to focus on one word that happens in that 
one sentence twice. Let me read it again. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. And that word we want to focus in on is the word in. Mm -hmm. In Adam and in Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, the way I was trained at seminary, the way I was... I was trained to understand how we relate to the fall of Adam or to the dying and rising of Christ. That sentence would make more sense if, if Paul had something like, because of Adam, all die, and because of Christ, all will be made alive. But Paul doesn't say because of Adam or because of Christ. Let me break that down for a second. Why do I say because? We tend to think of it like this. The Bible tells this big story that now we're a part of. And there are events that prior to our moment in the story that changed things. And because of that change, my life looks like this. Mm -hmm. Because of what happened back there with Adam, we live in a world with death. And therefore, I have to live in a world with temptation and death. And because of what Christ did 2,000 years ago, We live in a world where that can be overcome. And now I live in the wake of Christ's past event, the because. So think of it like this. In America, we live in the wake of the Revolutionary War. Because of that war, we have these freedoms. Because of that war, we are our own independent nation. This event changed political reality and therefore this. And we tend to think of Adam and his fall and Christ's and his death and resurrection as as kind of like the Revolutionary War, where they did something back there earlier in the story that we're a part of that has implications for us now. Mm -hmm. And we live, we die because of Adam, we will live because of Christ. But Paul says, in Adam we die, and in Christ we will be made alive, which is different. It's a different relationship. That's that uh, the relationship between us and Adam and us and Christ is um, this word in is expressing a different kind of relationship entirely. Just to kind of mm-hmm. to kind of dig a little bit deeper into what you're talking about there. You know, um, the link between, for example, something that happened back then, because that happened, I live this way now. Mm-hmm. The link we would say is a historical link. Mm -hmm. Basically something happened and that caused something else to happen, which caused something else to happen, which caused something else to happen. And then somewhere in that chain of historical events, one thing causing another thing to happen, Mm -hmm. somewhere you get far enough down that chain and there's me, the link in the chain. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden I now live a certain way because of what happened back then. So it's a historical chain. That's the relationship between me and that prior event. That's what the word because of indicates, Mm -hmm. right? But Paul doesn't use because of, he uses the word in, which is gonna communicate a different kind of relationship. The, not the only relationship or principal connection between me and Christ or me and Adam is this historical chain of events. It's actually a different kind of relationship altogether that he is trying to communicate. And I think that this is really important to see what kind of relationship that is and why it's different. So mm-hmm. um, I was, well, I was just going to say the because of relationship means there's this distance of time. Yes. This distance and plot of the story. Yes. It's back there. And we need either history or we need a theory to connect us to that. That's right. Or to understand that. But if it's in, what we need is not a history or a theory, but a way of seeing our present reality, my life here now, in Adam. Yes. The fall is in me. Yes. The dying because of or in the fall is in me, just as the living in the death and resurrection of Christ is in me. So what we need is not a history or a theory, but a way of seeing our own lives as in Adam or in Christ. Yes. So can I give you an example of the difference between, let's say, the fall and the cross and, you know, the Revolutionary War? I'm mm-hmm. going to use the example. The Revolutionary War, that happened, and all of those people that were part of that whole thing are gone. They died. They, died. they are no longer having any direct 
a impact or effect on present day reality. The impact or effect that they have is only because they did something back then and it caused something else, which caused something else, which caused something else, which knocked over the domino, which affects our life. But they have no direct bearing, direct mm -hmm. bearing on the reality today. But that cannot be the case with the cross. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It cannot be the case with Christ. And we would also suggest it can't be the case with Adam. There is a direct connection. Mm -hmm. if, if our relationship to Christ was because of that historical connection, then it could be potentially that Christ would could have been just like the Revolutionary War people. He died on the cross and he's gone. He's out of the picture. He saved us from our sin, mm -hmm. right? And now we live in the freedom because he bought the price or however you want to describe it. He, he did the saving work. And mm -hmm. now we live in new life because he did that back then. But Paul, this is really important for Paul. It, Christ can't be like that. He can't be dead and gone, and the effects are mm -hmm. just an indirect consequence. Mm -hmm. Christ's living now, his crucifixion now has a direct bearing and direct impact on my life. Mm -hmm. That's what it means to be in, in Christ that way. And that's one of the reasons why Christ is different than our relationship to the cross, our relationship to the fall, is a very different kind of relationship than... Um, the Revolutionary War, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that kind of historical um, relationship that we have that way. So. Yeah. So, um, so let, let's come at this uh, a slightly different way. Let's get a little bit more uh, direct. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to go ahead and go to a second passage that Paul wrote in Second Corinthians. So, another letter that he wrote to the same community. For Paul, not simply the resurrected Christ, because he's alive, is present to us now, but even the dying of Jesus was not simply an event in the past that has an effect. It's not simply that, well, back there, he offered the sacrifice that got us our, our freedom from sin, and now we can live in the wake and are free. For Paul, the dying of Jesus was a very much a present reality, and it was in him. So in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul writes this, um, He's talking about the difficulties of his life, and then he just starts talking about mortality as such, just dying. And he says this, that we are always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death, literally handed over to death, through Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So what's interesting there is if you were to ask Paul, say, where is the dying of Jesus at? He would point to his own dying body. Mm. Because the thing is, the dying of Jesus is not simply, it is a past event. It did happen 2,000 years ago on a hill called Golgotha. But because Jesus is the new human being, because he's the eternal son of God, because we are in him, that death, which was a sacrificial offering to the Father or, or to death, is now our reality, mm -hmm. right? So now, to use Paul's language, the decaying or the rotting of our body, the illnesses, the weaknesses that we suffer, even our dying participates. It takes part in the dying of Jesus. So think about that line. For the living are constantly being handed over to death through Jesus. Yes. Right? right. So whereas before Christ's dying, our death was just death. It was just separation from life and separation from God. But in Christ, it becomes the very offering to the Father in and through which there comes resurrection. Yeah. Right? So the dying of Jesus and its effect on my life isn't just back there. Rather, it's in me here and now. So a good example of this might be this. So if we could potentially put aside the, the Revolutionary War historical because of for a mm -hmm. minute and say, if the cross of Christ is not like that, what then is it like? What's this relationship like? Mm -hmm. um, a, an example we might use is it's sort of like the relationship between our everyday experience and the sun, the burning of the sun. If you think about it right now, um, 
it's getting colder every day. We see mm -hmm. the temperature falling. We go outside, we walk outside, we see the leaves are beginning to change. Um, they're going from green to brown. We could step outside and we could see the sun is about right here at this point. Um, you know, it's, it's 11 o'clock, right? It's at this point in the sky. Every single one of those instances, every single one of those events is happening and only happening because it's in some kind of greater, deeper relationship between the spinning earth and this great, you know, great sun, this great star. All of these events are happening and they're happening in history. They're happening mm -hmm. in time, but they're all within. They're happening because of there's some great relationship that's happening between earth and the sun and it's causing everything else to happen within this larger relationship. So mm -hmm. the way I would say, if we under, try to understand how the fathers would read the fall or the fathers would read the cross, what they would say is, is that all of these experiences, whether it's Paul's own personal experience or what's happening with Israel or what's happening anywhere along the way, it's all happening within this great this, this great expression of this is the love of God. This is who God is toward us. That's the sun and the earth. I mean, think about it this way. The cross happened um, in history, in time. But we also know that the lamb was slain before the foundations of the earth. Revelation. So there's a sense in which that happening in time is itself, it's an eternal relationship. Mm -hmm. It's a eternal relationship between God and us. Now, to work out the details of that, I mean, we could spend a lot of time racking our brain about it, but my point is, is it's better to think about our relationship with the cross, no, not so much like the cross of Christ is not our relationship like the historical one of our relationship to the forefathers in the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. Our relationship to the cross of Christ is like our experience today and all of those events happening throughout the day, from the temperature changing to the colors of the leaves to the location of the sun in the sky, it's all happening within something much greater. Yeah, so to take your analogy with the sun, everything we do on every day, every day, whether it's our, our eating or how we dress or simply the fact that there's life on earth, all comes from this constant relationship to the sun. Our rhythms of when we wake up and when we go to sleep, all of it's determined by our relationship to the sun. What Paul is saying is the dying and rising of Christ relates to us in that way. Yes. Not as just some past event that did this great thing and now we live in its wake, but rather the dying and rising of Jesus is like, is like a light that sh shines on the whole of our experience if we could see it. So the, here, so then like, um, we, how do I say this? How does the dying of this man, Jesus of Nazareth, save me, so to speak? We could produce a theory of how that event back there has some effect right now. But Paul says, no, no, look at all how the rhythms of, uh, of weakness and power, of dying and rising, we now see these all through the lens of Christ. Yes. All of my experiences I now see through the lens of Christ, his dying and rising. And so I understand all of these things, the ups and the downs of my life are not any longer simply the ups and the downs of my life. They're the living and the dying of Christ, or more properly, the dying and the rising mm -hmm. of Christ. Just like we live in the midst of the influence of the sun, S-U-N, so we live in the midst of the dying and rising of Christ. Yes. So one way I can I explain this through another scriptural image uh, before we move on to Adam, I suppose, or wherever you want to go, is let's think about the transfiguration of Christ. We know this story. I don't know if you know it. It's in the middle of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's where Christ takes uh, uh, Peter, James, and John up on top of the mountain, and it's revealed to them that he is the eternal Son of God. He shines with God's glory. Peter was there, and in his second letter in the New Testament, he says, hey, I was there. I heard the Father say, this is my beloved Son. And then he doesn't, but what, what's interesting is what Peter says is the significance of this. If you read first, Second Peter 1, he doesn't say, hey, because we had that happen back there, therefore now, because of that, now we live in assurance that he is the Son of God. He says, wait for the day where the transfiguration of Christ happens in your heart. 
So that past event where they went up on the mountain and Christ was revealed as the Son of God is something happening within us or can happen within us now. Yeah. The same with the dying and rising of Christ. So it, it is it is as true and right to say Christ is being crucified as to say Christ was crucified. What I mean by this is you see this in the bo- book of Hebrews. His offering, his sacrifice on the cross is an eternal sacrifice. There mm-hmm. is there is the reality of the Son interceding for us, right, as Again, to use the language of Hebrews, right, as the high priest, of being the offering, of being the, that, that gift in that way. That's something that's eternally happening. And it's almost as if, again, the, the occurrence in history is an expression for us in time of what's happening the, with the life of God eternally. It's sort of like when I look out and I see that, I see that leaf changing color on the tree. I see that and I say, that is that is happening in in this moment, in this time, because it's within this much greater mm-hmm. context. The Father pours himself out in love for us. The Son offers himself to the Father um, on our behalf. And the cross is cross is the, the crux of that. Mm-hmm. It's the point in history where we see that um, eternal relationship happening in time. So I, we could talk a little bit about Adam and the fall. We'll talk a lot about Christ, but then I want to talk about how this, this changes our relationship to the whole of Scripture, and then we can maybe transition to Maximus. Mm-hmm. Um, so the fall is also, uh, Paul says, we are in Adam and we're dying. So just as the dying and rising of Christ, he could actually point to in baptism, there's dying and rising. In my life, with illness and healing, there's dying and rising. At, at a funeral, there's dying, and then we trust in the rising. It's something right here, right now. So also the fall of Adam, of the human being. That's what Adam means, the human being. He could actually point to our lives and say, look, mm-hmm. there are these ways where we turn away from God and experience spiritual death. The fall is a present reality that I'm undergoing even now, mm-hmm. right? In the way in which, in a sense... I have been set down in a world as in a garden with all of these free gifts. All of it exists for me to commune with the Lord in my heart, but I turn away from it all the time. And in that we are in Adam, we are being turned away from God, turned towards ourselves and to the world in an improper way and are being separated from God in that. And it's a kind of of dying there, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm just I'm just trying to think about the you know the best way to try to 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 try to express some. So of these the description. Things, yeah. So here we do it this way. Maybe we can make the transition I already want to make to scripture. So if we accept the because of story, the sort of modern story, though it's older than that, that these are just past events that have implications. When we take up and read the scriptures, Old and New Testament, what we will see in that way, unlike the fathers, is uh, a part of a story that we're a part of. And it's just an earlier event leading to now. Whereas the ancient way of reading scripture was to see on every page, not simply Christ himself, but my life with Christ on every page. Mm -hmm. It's not an earlier moment in the story I'm embedded within, rather Christ in you, Christ in me, Christ in the church is on every page of scripture. Mm -hmm. My turning away from God is on every page of Scripture. So Genesis chapter 3 is not an earlier moment in the story. That's me. Yes. Yeah, and that's what we were saying when we were trying to get at the point like Genesis. We don't read Genesis in terms of just, oh, it's just pure history like it happened back then. Or it's just poetry and it's figure and it's, it's metaphor. Like what they're talking about is something very different than that. They're saying that what happened... What happened, um, what happened then is what's happening now. What's happening now is the heart of what's happened then. Like, mm-hmm. um, you want me to go to Maximus and kind of sure, get a sense sure. of like, this is how he understands scripture. So it would be interesting for us. I don't know if we can do this, but to compare a little bit about 
the way that Augustine tended to read scripture mm-hmm. to Maximus. But um, do we want to set things up that way or not? What do you think? Maybe we could do that. So we could ask, how did things change? Mm-hmm. How, how did we move from the in story where we are in Adam and in Christ and we, not simply Jesus, but we are on every page of scripture mm-hmm. to the because of story where the Bible is simply telling the story of things that happened beforehand that have implications for mm-hmm. me now. Mm-hmm. That breakdown, by and large, happens, um, I hate to lay everything at the feet of this guy, of a certain church father named Augustine. Some of you will know who he is, some of you may not. Augustine is a 4th century uh, theologian who spoke Latin. Mm-hmm. He was in Rome. 4th century means the late 300s. And um, Augustine was brilliant and wonderful, and his confessions are very much worth reading mm-hmm. as a spiritual guide. He's very great. But in what we call Western Christianity, after the Bible itself, Augustine is the greatest of authorities, the most influential figure. Mm-hmm. In the Reformation, the fight between the Catholics and the Protestants, it was largely a battle over how to read Augustine. Mm-hmm. And I just want to set this up because I don't want to just be Augustine bashing. Augustine, right, right. in many ways, is fantastic. Right. But he was so brilliant, he did some things that were kind of novel. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a variety of ways in which he actually removes Christ from every page of Scripture. And he makes, and with Christ being removed from every page, he's removed from every page. Yeah. And therefore, it has to become this big story with events in the past that have implications for us now. So, for instance, because he doesn't see Christ walking in the Garden of Eden and himself in the Garden of Eden, he sees Adam in some created symbol of God in the Garden of Eden. Because of that, he needs to build a theory, a history of how what Adam did there relates to me here and now. And so he produced a theory, and that theory was this. Why don't you explain the theory, Wes? <laughs> so his theory was this. Well, his question was, is why, why would I suffer the guilt of sin to be, quote, in Adam if mm-hmm. Adam's the one who actually disobeyed God? What's the connection or the relationship, right, mm-hmm. between me as, as being culpable, as bearing the burden of sin and guilt, when uh, Adam's the one who actually did, did the deed? He's the one who... who um, uh, trespassed against the commandment of God for, for uh, Augustine. So mm-hmm. what he said was basically, I existed in the loins, in the genitalia of Adam. So Thanks for specifying after <laughs> loins. We could have just stuck with loins. That was enough. So Adam thought, Adam thought that, I'm sorry, Augustine speculated that that in the body of Adam, in his loins, were the seed of every human being that was well, to good come. With seed. Don't explain that any further. Right. So when Adam committed the crime, I was actually in Adam yeah. that way. I was in his loins, yeah. literally. So the in language becomes becomes because of language, in a sense. Right. right? It, now, that's partially due to the fact that Augustine didn't read Greek. He right. just read Latin, right. and there was a really bad translation of the Book of Romans mm-hmm. uh, going around because he actually thought you and I are born guilty of sin, right? Uh, and the and he had to come up with some way of understanding this. Right. Now he doesn't have this view of Scripture where he and his relationship to Christ is on every page, mm-hmm. so he's got to have some theory like, okay, how does that guy way back there? sinning in that way, right. make me guilty and worthy of death. And that's yeah. his theory, which you so vividly described for us. <laughs> so, but this is the point. This is the point. Augustine, Augustine is a figure, has a huge influence on the Catholic tradition and the Protestant tradition all the way up to today. Mm-hmm. So one of the reasons why we tend to read when we go to the Bible and we read the fall or we read about the cross and we read the because of story, because Adam did this, I die. Because Christ did this, I can be made alive. Rather than in him, these things are happening. In Christ, these things are happening. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why is through the influence of this notable church father, this notable church father in the West. We We don't really have that trajectory so much in the Eastern churches, in the Eastern tradition. And in fact, they're able to hang on to the in idea a mm-hmm. lot more um, mm-hmm. solidly. Yeah, I mean, Paul um, himself says clearly, essentially, that 
he and his relationship to Christ, the church and its relationship to Christ, is on every page of the scriptures, which right. is what we understand as the Old Testament. Yeah. Augustine, that, that we begin to lose a hold of that, and there's all these weird ways to try to get it back, Yeah. but it, it kind of perverts that. So, so basically, in the West, you have more and more predominantly the image of, of what God's doing in the world is this great sort of salvation history story. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a story it's a historical story and we're one chapter late, late, late in the story. But in the Eastern tradition and a lot of the Eastern fathers what we see is they don't see that at all. What they see is again, they see more of like the orbit of the sun, to use that other conception. Yeah. Mm-hmm. These things, we are in them, we're experiencing them now as realities. To and give every, you Yeah, and every page of scripture, every page is me and Adam, me and Christ, or the church and Christ. So to give you an example of this different conception, I just want to read you a little bit here from Maximus. Listen to the way he encourages us to read scripture. This is from his uh, questions uh, to Thalassius. So Maximus the Confessor, who we've quoted, he he comes on the scene about 100 years or so after Augustine, Mm -hmm. but he's in the eastern part of the empire, Greek speaker. Mm -hmm. So listen to the way he encourages us to read scripture. He says, anyone who examines the inner meaning of scripture's enigmas or questions with the fear of God and for the sake of divine glory alone and removes the letter from around the spirit as though it were a veil shall find all things in front of him according to the word of wisdom with no impediment hindering the mind's blameless motion toward divine things. I want to read a little bit more, but let's stop there. So what he's saying here is if we approach the scripture, what, what's necessary for us to approach scripture to understand it? The fear of God mm-hmm. and for the sake of divine glory. I'm seeking to recognize the theophany. That's the appearance of God. That's what I'm looking for. That's the spiritual life. You begin with the fear of God, you move into the glory of God. Yes. And who removes from the letter from around the spirit as though it were a veil. So here what he has is the central, the central meaning of scripture is something of spiritual of a spiritual essence, right? Mm -hmm. When we start to look at the history, when we look at the literature, we look at all these things, it's almost like the clothing, if we're gonna use, again, use that example of this is an eternal truth that's wrapped in history, right? That's expressed in history, And he's doing a very New Testament thing. Paul himself is the opposition between the letter Mm -hmm. of scripture and the spirit of scripture. The letter is the apparent just story. Yes. The spirit is where we find ourselves in relation to Christ. Yes, and he says, if we do this, they shall or the peop- those who do this shall find all things in front of him. So again, it's interesting. It's not like it was removed back then, sometime in the past. They'll understand what happened about the fall or the cross back then. They will see it in front of them. Yes. Confronted. There's no distance there. There's no removal. If there is a removal, it's because of sin, not because right. of history. Right. It's because of my own blindness, my own callousness, because of the passions. That's the only, that's the distance. Yes. Not that it happened back then versus what's yeah, happening it's, now. So the fall of Adam, it's here when I make old man West jokes because, yes, right. because of you know various <laughs> ailments due to your advanced age. The dying of Jesus also in the old man west jokes yes. right you're you're dying in your advanced age of 41 <laughs> like this I is really you're part that, of the yeah. offering to the father in the death mm-hmm. of, like so the those things in the pages of scripture aren't just back there in history you don't need a historian to tell you or right. a theorist to tell you how it works it's here it's in us we're spiritual reality yeah. now At, He's dying in Adam. He's old. <laughs> he's, he's being handed over through Christ to the Father. But you were, you were in his loins too, so you need to... <laughs> You're going to suffer story. the guy. <laughs> it's the wrong I know, story. I know, I'm I know. too Just young to know. I'm too young. I haven't experienced any of this dying. Perfect health. Ooh, so anyway, so let's continue this. This is such good stuff. It says, let us therefore leave aside the written account of what has already occurred corporeally in Moses' time. Corporeally can- meaning like a body in a body way Th- think, think letter way. body yeah. spirit right and consider with the eyes of the intellect i'm going to guess right there that's the noose right um that's my guess anyway mm-hmm. it's spiritual power which is constantly occurring and becoming ever greater by its very occurrence so what he's saying here is what happened with moses is happening now 
Mm-hmm. What happened, right? The the spiritual essence of what happened when Moses, for example, led Israel through the Red Sea, right? That that wasn't just something that happened back then. That is an expression of something that's happening now. And when we go with our eyes open, it confronts us. The actual reality of God and his relationship to us confronts us now because it's constantly occurring and becoming ever greater with its very occurrence mm-hmm. in that. Mm-hmm. So let's go back to Moses and the, the, you know, the Red Sea. Yeah, it's telling you a story that happened in the past. But according to Maximus and according to Paul, who addresses this specifically, that's just the letter. That's just the body. And we want to get under the letter, under the body, to the spirit. Mm -hmm. And what we find there is an immediate relationship. What these words are describing, the reality they point to, because it's not just metaphors, is the church's relationship to Christ right here, right now. Your relationship to Christ right here, right now. Yeah, so this is what Paul says. I mean, when they classic examples he uses is um, when Moses strikes the rock in the desert, right? He, he doesn't say, he says, when, when, he, when, he gives, when he gives a description of Moses striking the rock in the desert, St. Paul says, and the rock is Christ. Is. Not the rock symbolized Christ or it happened back then and today our rock. No, <clears throat> that rock is Christ. So when Moses struck the rock and water came forth to feed and nourish the people of Israel, that there is a spiritual reality at its core that's even deeper than what happened with Moses and the rock. It's actually Christ and us, us being nourished by Christ. That's the reality Mm -hmm. that Moses striking the rock uh, uh, communicates, um, expresses, and in some sense, Moses himself experiences, St. Paul would say, I would argue, he's experiencing Christ in that event. Absolutely, no question. So he's encountering, Moses is encountering Christ when yeah, he strikes I mean, the rock, just as we encounter Christ as as those rocks are struck in our life I mean, as well. Again, Paul yeah. himself, the Apostle Paul, uh, talking about the various stories of, of Moses and the Hebrews in the wilderness as these things were written down for us. They're descriptions of our own spiritual life. Now, that's not saying they weren't past events. We're not saying this is all just right. But they're present to us in the spiritual life now. Yes. We have one in the same life with Moses, we have one in the same life with Adam, uh, and so forth. It, it, yeah, 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 yeah. I think one of the things we want to talk about here, though, I think that's really important, is that approaching this differently takes more than just um, how do I say it? A theology degree, or right. to read Scripture this way, to read Scripture such that, as Maximus says, these realities are in front of us. And they are revealing themselves, they are constantly occurring, and their occurrence is happening in even greater ways. Mm -hmm. That that's only possible for us to understand and encounter scripture that way through the spiritual life. That, Mm -hmm. see, we go back to that whole thing. Theology and spirituality aren't two different things. Right. So the only way we understand these things in the proper way theologically is because it's through spiritual formation and specifically we could say through the kind of discipline that we've been learning with Evagrius and spiritual Mm -hmm. formation that way, right? It's through encountering Christ and experiencing Christ in the struggle of the spirit, right? Um, That we begin to understand and read ourselves on every page, to see Mm -hmm. ourselves on every page, to see Christ on every page of scripture. It's the spiritual context that's required for us to see that. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, think about, you know, what happened when we went off to seminary and we studied is we got really, really good at the letter of Scripture. Yeah. Right? We learned the history. We learned the body of Scripture. But what we're trying to do in the podcast here is do something that academic degrees, we can use that. We, we put that to great effect. But we don't want to stop there. Because if you stop at the letter of Scripture, just the history stuff and the, the theories and so forth, Paul says clearly, it gives death. And what happens, again, when we think of getting smart in Scripture, going off and getting these degrees, is we just get really good in the letter. There's nothing wrong with that. But the point is to move to the spirit of Scripture, which doesn't require different intellectual disciplines. Well, the letter by itself kills. The letter by itself kills. I mean, kills. we have to realize that, right? Yeah. Paul says that 
directly in 2 Corinthians. But what is needed to do this is not to have PhDs. Mm. It's rather to, to engage in the spiritual life, which is to say to train, like we talked about. To take your life as not simply, um, it's not just there. The trials and temptations you go through, those are there. You can take up the dying of Christ in those things, right? You can take up the rising in Christ and how you understand when good things come. There are disciplines of prayer, of fasting, and so forth, where you can see in the struggles of Scripture, they're your own struggles that you take up. It can become yours if you actually engage in a life of prayer, of fasting, of training, of asceticism. So it's important wherever you live, in whatever context, to come to see your life as part of this, not Mm -hmm. simply living in the wake of the biblical stories, but that they're playing out in you. The only way you can see that is through prayer. Mm -hmm. The only way you can see that is through uh, an imitation of the life of Jesus or of Paul, right, and the things Mm -hmm. they did. Yeah, so take take for take for example our relationship to Christ now, um, as we struggle as we struggle for example with I don't know let's just say for example with gluttony, right? What's offered to us by Christ, and by and by the tradition and by the fathers is something like fasting, mm-hmm. and when we fast we we face head on, right, that obstacle of gluttony, and we find ourselves struggling against those things. We find ourselves in need of mercy and in need of grace and in need of spiritual strength. And we cry out in prayer to Christ himself who encounters us in the midst of that struggle Mm -hmm. to give us strength, to give us his his own example in the gospel, right? And so what we begin to realize is then in that context, as we're going through that, when we read about, for example, Christ's temptation in the wilderness, Christ's temptation in the desert, the principal question isn't so much, well, how did that happen and what went down back then? It's, this, this is my experience now as I struggle with gluttony. This is my yeah. experience as I fast. Right. Where yeah. is Christ now in yeah. this? How is he feeding and nourishing me now? Re- you know, read the temptation narratives in the midst of a fast. Yes. And, uh, you know, so I'm thinking of uh, Ephraim the Syrian. It was a 4th uh, century Syrian. And um, he's got this great uh, commentary on Genesis, which uh, is just poems. Mm -hmm. But his description of what the scriptures do to him in relationship to the Garden of Eden is it places him down in that place. And he sees everything that happens through the eyes of each character. And I think that's important. When you read the Gospels, you need to you need to try your best to to be um, the blind man crying out, Lord Jesus, I want to see. Yes. You need to learn to see the blind man through the eyes of Jesus. Likewise, when you read the Old Testament, when you read the stories about Moses, try your best to see the world as Moses sees it. When you read uh, the stories about Adam and Eve, try your best to see that from Adam's perspective, Eve's perspective, from God's perspective. Mm. Ask yourself questions like, why did God who know everything say, Adam, where are you? Mm-hmm. What have you done? Right? Mm-hmm. I think the answer there is he's, he's giving him every chance to repent. Mm-hmm. So put yourself in every story as every character, mm-hmm. right? And do that in the context of your own struggles. And when you do that, and yeah, and, and, and when you do that, let me say this. When you do that, when you put yourself in the context of those different figures— it's not just, oh, this is some neat way of reading scripture or some new the- theory. What you're doing there is you're practicing being an Adam and being in Christ. Because no matter where you are in that story, for example, let's say if we read a gospel story about the Pharisees, right? And we read ourselves as the Pharisee. What we're doing is we're, we're learning to see that we are in Adam in yeah. those stories, right? right? And when we see, for example, when we read the story of the woman washing uh, Christ's feet um, and and Christ saying this story should be told this woman right we're seeing ourselves in Christ that that woman right there is expressing herself in mm-hmm. in Christ right mm-hmm. so we begin to see in each one of these 
um, each one of these characters, we're learning and we read ourselves into those stories. It is that we are practicing being an Adam. We are practicing being in Christ mm -hmm. in that way. And that's when those realities, as Maximus says, start to, they start to become, they appear before us. This is, to be honest, this is all theophany. It's all yeah. God saying, this is who I am, and this is who you are. Right. All of that's happening. Well, and it's in it's all the same life, scripture. right? So this is uh, to get to pick on Augustine again, Saint Augustine, great guy. But basically, he removes Jesus from out of the Old Testament, other than the, he's prophesied to the ancient way of reading in the Garden of Eden. Who is walking around the Garden with Adam and Eve? It's not just God; it's Christ. Who is it that Moses encounters on the mountaintop? It's not an angel or just some created fireworks. It's Christ. Every prophet who ever encounters God, hears God, it's Christ. And here's the point. All of Scripture, all of these stories are telling the story of somebody's life with Christ, running away from him or running towards him. That's your life and that's my life. Mm -hmm. Adam lived the same life we live, one in relation to Christ. One, where there are occasions of repentance missed or gained. All of it is living in, or it's, it's the same life. So when we read it, when we read about Adam's relating to the God who walks in the garden, it's the same as ours with the God who walks with us in Jesus Christ. Our life is on every page if you recognize Christ is in all these things. When Moses goes up to the mountain and he's transformed and he receives the law, he's encountering Jesus Christ. It's no different than when Christ speaks to us in the heart. It's mm. the same life. Yep. Yep. Well, you know what? I hope I hope this uh, can set the stage for some further conversations in, in uh, season three as we dive into yeah. season three. Um, I, I'm really excited to see where we go. We really want to hear more of your guys' input. I'm excited to see our going. new set. Yeah. Because John is doing some work. He's got some great mm -hmm. ideas to get mm -hmm. the set set up. It'll mm -hmm. look very different when we come back. Yeah. Hey, and by the way, something's been bugging me throughout the discussion. I should clarify real quick. This might be a little fine point. But I think what I said wasn't quite right when I said um, Christ is being crucified. Um, I, it's, it would be more appropriate to say Christ was crucified. But... He, he, that sacrifice is an eternal sacrifice in that way. And that um, the love that was expressed in that sacrifice is something eternally given. So Yeah, but um, the dying, the dying of Christ is carried out dying. in the dying of all of his children. Yeah, I mean, it's a neat we're the body point, of Christ. And, and maybe we'll chat about it when we're done with this, mm -hmm. uh, the filming. But, um, um, yeah, there's well, an interesting relationship there. Okay. Um, yeah, tell me. Tell well, me. just Origen, a church father Origen, he said Christ will be crucified until the end of the world. Yeah. So yeah. that would be something to jump into. Yeah. And I don't think he means out there in some cosmic place, but yeah. in here, okay. in us. Anyway, that's just a side note. Oh, it's worth talking about. Hey, tell us what you think. Yes. So. Yeah. Thanks for joining us for season two. Season three will be coming soon in a few weeks to about a month. It'll be different. We'll be doing different things. We won't be reading through a book this time. And we're going to try to be as responsive to you as possible. Don't forget November 5th, if you're in the area, drop into Restoration Park Church at 7. Remember the 5th of November. Remember the 5th of November. Thanks, guys. See you. Bye.